we're glad to be sharing the ministry of Redemption Church with you. Now join us as we receive the Word of God. Hello, Redemption Church. Are you all doing well today? Are you excited? You glad to be in the house of the Lord? I am absolutely glad to be here. Our God makes all things new, right? Hello to everyone online. Thank you guys for for leaving comments and uh, giving us thumbs up and five stars on podcasts and all all those things that help us on the internet. We're glad you're tuning in and we can't wait to share the God's word with you also. God wants to do new things in you wherever you are right now watching, listening. We're in the fourth week of our sermon series. Remind me one more time, what's this called? All All Things New. I want to remind you that Jesus brings us new in Acts chapter Two, right? Absolutely. Uh, I have been hearing that somebody has been working up a rap, actually. I won't call out Gracie's name because that would be embarrassing. We have been looking closely at the new powerful things that happened in Acts chapter 2. I want to remind you by reading together Acts 2, 37. When the people heard this quick, what was this that they heard? The gospel of Jesus Christ, the death of the burial, and the resurrection. When the people heard this, they were cut to their heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? Wouldn't it be terrible if the chapter and the book just ended right there? But no, it doesn't. The next verse, Peter answers their question. Acts 2.38, Peter replied. Somebody say, repent and be baptized. Say it. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins and you will receive the gift of the say it Holy Spirit. All right. Jesus does something new in Acts chapter two. Look at somebody. Tell them that you can wrap it if you want. I will not beatbox for you, though. All right. In week one, we talked about hearing and believing the gospel. That's the good news, man. We got we have to preach the good news more and more and more. We can never get away from the good news of Jesus Christ. Right. There's a lot of things that we need to talk about, but we of primary importance is the gospel. We cannot get away from it. Hearing the gospel is brand new. New In week two, we told you about the power of repentance, where you are turning away from your sin, you are changing your mind, you are changing your life, and you are turning to the Savior, Jesus Christ. Repenting of your sins, turning to Jesus, it is brand new. In week three, last week, we told you about baptism. Being buried in Christ is brand new. And next week, we're going to baptize six people in this church. How about that? Can we clap? Are we? You go ahead and go whoop. Thank you, Lord. I love it. I love it. I love it. Six people have declared that they want to be baptized in the wonderful name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't that exciting? Thank you, Lord. We want to baptize more. We want to preach the gospel to more. We want more and more. Keep doing new things in your church, Lord. There is still more new for you. Still more. Tonight, we're going to be stepping into the newness of the spirit. Let's look again at that next at that uh, at that all important verse in in Acts chapter two, verse thirty eight. Let's look at it one more time. Peter replied, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. All right. You need you need me to be transparent with you. I'm going to be transparent with you for just a second before we just really jump into this. Can I tell you something true? Being a preacher is not easy. It's it's not easy. Okay, it's not easy, and there's a lot of weird pressures that come with being a pre- preacher, right? Cool. Uh, there is a real pressure to try to only say things that are going to make everyone happy. Like that's a real pressure, right? Believe it or not, most preachers, most maybe some, but most preachers don't want to get up there and hack off everybody and make everybody mad. There are some preachers I've bet that might <laughs> kind of like that but most preachers don't want to get up and th- they don't want to say anything that that's going to make people feel uncomfortable they don't want to say anything that's going to start an argument they don't want to say anything that someone might disagree with and there's always this pressure check there is a pressure that comes from receiving from god what what you're going to preach all right and and go whoa 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 and whoa what about that person well that person right there man they, they might not like this they no 
We're going to talk about it. It's a very real preacher, and I don't know a preacher alive who has not felt it at some point. Can we just be honest? Is that all right? Is it okay if I'm honest? But Peter, Peter stood up in Acts 2, and he gave a most uncomfortable message. He looked those people in the eyes, and he told them about the death of the burial, and the resurrection. If that's not enough, he pinned Jesus' death on them. (laughs) Whoa. You talk about uncomfortable. You want to talk about a preacher who had an uncomfortable message? How How about that one right there? And although it was uncomfortable, can I tell you it was absolutely true? And we need to accept this uncomfortable truth. I want to tell you right now that the gospel is uncomfortable. Can you say that sentence with me? The gospel is uncomfortable. The gospel will look you right in the eye and it will tell you that Jesus loves you, but it will also tell you the way you're living is not right. The gospel will tell you you got to change. The gospel says as you are is not good enough. You got to come further. And that is uncomfortable, but that is the gospel. And we cannot be afraid of that. The, the, the good news is the love of Jesus, but the, also the good news is that you have a way of escape. Peter says in Acts 2 that you need to save yourself from this untowards generation. If he's saying that they need to save themselves, in other words, he's saying that they are not, at this point, saved. Do you agree? That's part of the gospel. Part of the gospel, something has to click in your heart. I'm not saved. I don't have all that there is of God. I need more of God that Jesus desperately loves me and wants me to have more. And I don't have it. And I don't have it. And can I tell you that all over this Metroplex, preachers got up and they preached nowhere near that message and we need to get close to that message that message needs to be heard it's got to be heard and acts 2 peter stood up under the power of the holy spirit and he gave us that uncomfortable message stepping into new is often uncomfortable as i told you last week the deeper you step into new the more voices will appear and they'll tell you oh you don't have to do that right and y'all know i'm right on this right The deeper you step into new, somebody's going to go, oh, in fact, I would tell you that the deeper you step into new, the fewer voices of encouragement you'll get. If you're doing this really separates, you know, the men from the boys in, in serving Jesus, because if you're doing if you're trying to serve Jesus for compliments, man, do I have bad news for you. If you're trying to serve Jesus because you want everything in life to be rosy and perfect, man, I've got bad news for you because that's not why you serve Jesus. He says you're going to be hated for my name's sake. He says that things will come up against you because of me. He said I've come with the sword and I'm actually going to divide families, families that choose this truth and families that divide this, that, that they deny this truth. If you think that the gospel is comfortable, You need to read your Bible. Look at somebody say, you need to read your Bible. Amari, you need to read your Bible. You got a new Bible recently. You need to read it, buddy. All right. God did a new thing in Acts 2 that alarms people today so much that they rarely touch the book of Acts. Some of y'all have been in church after church. Y'all have been in more than one church, and it's pretty rare to touch the book of Acts. Right? You might touch a story like the Philippian jailer and then get out of Acts as quick as you can. Right? Quick little story about Paul and Silas in jail, and then you get out real quick. Oh, man, we, we, we got out of that book just in time. Right? Because there, there are these alarming new things that actually scares people, actually worries people. But I want to tell you plainly, just as Peter told that crowd, you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And if that makes you unnerved tonight, you need to get over it. I'll say it again. But you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. My goodness, I don't have time to tell you all the weird hang-ups that churches have on the book of Acts and the Holy Spirit. But my goodness, we could write a full novel series on, on, on the hang-ups people have. We're going to get over that tonight. 
I'm praying for you tonight. If you've got past hangups from your church upbringing, I want you to get over that tonight. Jesus has new for you. He's got new. Peter told them about the gift of the Holy Spirit, and he had only had this gift for like five minutes. I want you to get this picture. But you shall receive the gift of, oh man, he must have had it for like months and years, right? He probably went to Bible college and then, no, no, he just received this thing. He was as flipped out as they were. <laughs> he was not, no one was prepared for this. In fact, you can read it in your Bible. Jesus tells him, I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit. But he never t prepares them for how drastic and how powerful and how mind-blowing and how different it's going to be. And he's like, when it went, like what, just blown away by this wind and it's just crazy. And now he's preaching and now he's telling other people they are going to receive it. Can I tell you something? The moment you receive Jesus, that's the moment you can tell somebody. The moment you receive truth, that's the moment you can tell somebody. You don't have to wait for somebody. You don't have to wait for your pastor to come along and say, hey, I think, I think you've been around the church long enough. Now you can share this truth. No, go immediately. Share the truth that you have. Is that good? Yeah. All right. Peter and the others who had gathered in that upper room had just received this heavenly gift. So let's study what that looked like. Let us start back in Acts chapter 1 where Jesus gave them a command and a promise. Acts chapter 1 verse 4. These are red letters, y'all. This is Jesus speaking. On one occasion while he, Jesus, was eating with them, he gave them this command. Say command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised. Someone say promised. Which you have heard me speak about. Move on down to verse 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So they stayed in what city? Jerusalem. Why'd they say? Jesus told them to, right? And, and they stayed for the promised gift and because of the command. And this promised gift was the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus gave them no further directions. And he certainly didn't describe what was about to take place. Let's go to the next chapter, chapter 2, verse 1. When the day of Pentecost came, this is 50, 50 days after the Day of Atonement after the Passover. The word Pentecost actually means 50. I was raised Pentecostal, and it was way long before I realized the word Pentecost meant 50. And I'm like, that just makes no sense. What is happening? We're the 50 church. Uh, but it's because 50 days after Passover comes the Day of Pentecost. All right. So Acts 2, verse 1, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. Verse 4, all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. I want to focus on these verses for just a moment. I want to ask some questions and see if all together we can understand uh, this happening of the infilling of the spirit in verse two. What does scripture say filled the house? Can we go back to verse two? Look at that. What does it say filled the house? A sound. You see, that's I, I still make this mistake. I talk about the wind filling the house. It, if you read it closely, it's not that the wind fills the house, but it's the sound of a of a wind. All right. So excellent. Sound of a wind fills the house. All right. A sound of wind. This entry of the spirit is just as Jesus described in John chapter 3 verse 8. Let's look at it. John 3 8. The wind blows where it pleases. You hear its sound but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So is with everyone born of the spirit. You understand this? You see this? Did you ever put this together? All right. Jesus didn't ever waste words. Everything he said tied to a thing that happened, tied to a thing that needs to happen in us. And so they realized this through the power of the Holy Spirit. They remembered what Jesus had said. The wind blows where it pleases. You hear its sound. That is everyone that is born of the Spirit. 
Okay, ask this question. How many of those gathered together were filled with the Spirit? How many of them? There were 120 in that upper room. Acts 1 says, how many of them were filled? Let's go back to Acts chapter 2. Which one does that? It's probably 2. Verse 2 tells us. Acts 2 and 2. Do we have that? How many of them were filled? Like half of them? A few of them? The ones that really prayed hard? The ones that cried? How many of them? Somebody help me. How many? They were all filled. All right? They were all filled with the Holy Spirit. This is verse 4. Go to verse 4. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. No, wait. How did they know they were filled with the Spirit? We're just going to get real. How did they know in verse 4? How did they know they were filled with the Spirit? Did a certain light come on? Did, did an angel tell them that this had happened? No. They knew they were waiting for something. And then this is the moment where something happened in them. You see, everything else in this moment is stuff happening in the room. The wind fills the room. The sound of the wind fills the room. Sorry, see, it's hard, hard to break that habit. Sound of the wind fills the room, but that's not filling you. But something filled them, and it caused them to do something. What was it? They spoke in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. All right, so this was certainly new, right? Yeah, okay. And as we study the rest of the book of Acts, we see more believers filled with the Spirit. What accompanies the infilling is not a sound of wind. That only happened this one time at this initial outpouring. Also, it talks about tongues of fire resting on them. It doesn't, doesn't happen every time. True story, Teresa's here, my, my good friend from Waco. Her son, Brandon, and I grew up in church, and I said, oh, man, I want, I want to to be filled with the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost. And Brandon, it says, why? Tell me about it. I'm like, it's so gnarly. Fire is going to set on your head. It's going to be awesome. All right. And, G and Brandon went back to his mom and said, I do not want the Holy Ghost. I do not want fire on my head. It, you don't receive the fire, and you, uh, uh, it's not a literal fire, and you're not receiving a literal wind. All right. You with me? You follow me? Okay. What accompanies this infilling is not the sound of a wind. The sound of wind that Jesus spoke of only occurred in Acts 2. It served its purpose of revealing to the people that they had received what Jesus spoke of, being born again of the Spirit. Yet, as we study the rest of Scripture, can I point out it is important to study the rest of Scripture. You do not form a biblical doctrine over one verse. You do not do it. You don't do it, okay? The w I can point you to some weird doctrines that just have one verse, and it's crazy, all right? Baptizing for dead people, crazy stuff. It's just insane. Yeah, what? I'll talk, we'll talk later. We'll talk later. It's pretty crazy. All right, so as we study the rest of Scripture, where it describes the moment someone's being filled with the Holy Spirit, a sound accompanies that infilling. That sound is speaking in tongues. Acts 10, Acts 11, Acts 19, for example. This might make you uncomfortable, but let's look at the Word of God. Let's be bold about it. We got something new to look at. Acts chapter 10, verse 44 through 46. Who receives the Spirit in Acts chapter 10? Somebody tell me. Cornelius, Gentiles receive it. Acts 44, verse 44, chapter 10. While Peter was speaking these words, what words do you think he was speaking? Words about Jesus, the gospel of Jesus Christ. He was preaching to them about repentance. He was preaching about the blood of the Lord Jesus. While he's speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. The circumcised believers, that's the, Gentile, the Jews, believed who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on even out even on Gentiles, for they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. Verse 46, read that out loud with me. For they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. How'd they know? I'll just let you answer that yourself. How'd they know? How did they know? How did they know that they had received the same thing that they had received. One chapter later, Peter is back in Jerusalem and he is explaining this occurrence because it's the first time Gentiles had ever been saved. 
And they weren't just kind of saved. They had received everything that Jews had received from God. Acts eleven fifteen. As I began to speak, Peter said, the Holy Spirit came on them as he had come on us at the beginning. Beginning of what? The beginning of the church. The beginning as in the first time this whole thing happened. Where was that? Acts chapter 2. He's saying that the same thing and the same gift, the same outpouring happened to them just like it happened to us. It had no deviation. It was just the same as it happened on us in the beginning. Do you see what I'm talking about here? And do you agree with it? All right. The Holy Spirit came exactly like it had come on us in the beginning. So the first time God did this brand new thing. And now Gentiles, non-Jews are receiving the spirit in the same way. He, we received him in the beginning. All right. How did they know the Gentiles received that spirit? Well, Acts 10, 46, it says, for they heard them. Remember, Jesus said that there's a sound for they heard them. Acts eleven fifteen says it happened the same way. Acts 19, let's jump to Acts 19. Verse one, while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. There he found some disciples and asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They answered, no, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. So Paul asks, then what baptism did you receive? John's baptism, they replied. Can I tell you, this is a powerful passage on baptism. Water baptism. Let me explain very quickly. These disciples had never, ever received the Holy Spirit, much less heard of the Holy Spirit. They were in need of a Bible study, weren't they? Excellent. They didn't even know about the Holy Spirit. They did just just now. They found out there was something they hadn't received. There's something brand new. Fortunately, they had the greatest Bible study teacher in front of them, right? They had the Apostle Paul right there in front of them. Now, Paul wants these disciples to be filled with the what? With the who? The Holy Spirit. Wants them to be filled with the Spirit. Why else bring up the Spirit in filling? But then Paul asked something that would bewilder many churches today. He asked this question, how were you water baptized? If water baptism is just an empty ritual of the church, why would Paul ask such a thing? Here's the answer. Water baptism is not an empty ritual of the church. And if you have not received this new thing of the spirit, then we need to step back a little bit and see what else you're missing. If you're not having the spirit, the question is, what else are you missing? Have you been baptized in the name of Jesus? And these men had been baptized unto repentance, but they were in this chapter, baptized again in a different way. Verse 4, Paul said John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him. That is in Jesus on hearing this. They were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. They were baptized how? In the name of of the Lord Jesus. Then what happened? Verse 6 happened when Paul placed his hands on them. The Holy Spirit came on them and they spoke in tongues and they prophesied. Now I, I want to tell you this, I am willing to talk with anyone about this. I would I would challenge you to show me the place in the Bible where it describes someone filled with the spirit and does not describe the something being heard. This does not fully describe someone even speaking in tongues. I would challenge you to do that. I would be glad to talk to you about that. All right. What does it mean to be filled? I want to talk to you about that. Look at somebody and say, what does it mean to be filled? I have a very sophisticated setup here. Very sophisticated. I don't want to lose anybody on this setup. Thank you, Sarah. My wife is very wise. And I'm very messy. So right here, we have a wonderful Starbucks cup right here. Is this Starbucks cup filled? It is not filled. Do you agree? There is no water in it. Now, do you think 
it's filled How's that? Is there more water in it? Yeah, but is it filled? It is not filled. All right. So we can do a little better. We got plenty of water. Can We're halfway. Should I keep going? It's not filled yet? Okay. Okay, we're, we're three-fourths. Who wants to stop? It's all right. No, wait. Right there, are we are we satisfied with that? Now you don't think this is all. This is like there's like one inch left. You don't think this is filled yet? It's full according to Starbucks. Yeah, those cheats. <laughs> At least it's not five bucks. All right. So this isn't full. Do you think it's full? Why is it not full? Somebody tell me why it's not full. There's still room left to be occupied. Not until there is no room left. See that? If you, if you could come up here really close. I don't know if our video could come here. But, like, it's not quite there yet. I want to tell you something. The only way to be truly filled is to overflow. Now is it filled? Yes. Is it filled now? Yes. Is there any room left? Yes. There's no room left. I want to tell you this, that when the believers were filled with the Holy Spirit, it wasn't that they just got a little dosage of God's Spirit, that it overflowed their heart. It overflowed all that they were. And when it overflowed, they started to speak in another language that they never knew, and it was supernatural. They're filled with something supernatural. So guess what overflows from them? It is supernatural. And then everybody heard them, what they were saying in their own language, and it was crazy. How were they hearing it? But by, by, by the supernatural. And they were actually declaring they didn't know it, themselves but they were declaring the good works of God and everybody heard it because they were filled to overflowing they were filled to overflowing are you following me are you following me all right so right here I've got another cup we're gonna we see this we've got another beautiful Starbucks cup it's just like the other cup right there's no difference there's no difference between what what's the difference it's got a lid. That won't stop anything, right? We're going to fill this up just the same, right? Just going to fill that up. We're going to be okay. All right, that should do it, right? Are we full yet? Are we okay? We fi What? Gosh, we're going to fill this up, right? What? Somebody speak to me. What am I doing wrong here? You got to take, go man, he's preaching. Amari. What'd you say, sir? You gotta take the lid off. There are lids that can keep you from being filled with newness of God. Can I tell you something? There are lids that you can have. I believe denominations can put unbelievable lids on us. And we don't do that that way because I am fill in the blank denomination and we just have this lid on us. Some some people, a lack of repentance <coughs> is a lid. Nobody <coughs> can be filled with the Holy Spirit if they have a la lid of disobedience. The Bible has told you to repent of your sin. And if you're holding on to your sin, it is a lid. If you... Some people have this lid. They've actually repented, but they're still living in shame. My God, if God's forgiven you, you ought to forgive you. But people live in that shame, and they're, they're like, there's people, I see them, they, they, I'm not going to go down that altar, I'm guilty, I'm a sinner, I'm full of shame. You get that lid off of you. God cannot fill you with that lid on you. Let's keep going. Pride is a lid. Pride will be a lid. I have never somebody, I've never seen somebody get saved and they were prideful. 
never seen it. Pride will keep you out of a baptismal tank. Pride will keep you out of an altar. Pride will keep you from repenting. Pride will keep you from crying in front of people and being moved on by the Spirit. You got to take off the You got to take off the lid. Those people in Acts chapter 2, in Acts chapter 10, in Acts chapter 19, they removed the lid. Do you understand that those disciples of John, they didn't look at Paul? They could have. They could have looked at Paul and said, oh, no, that's not how we do things. John taught us to do it like this. That would have been a lid. But they just said, okay. Let's receive this Jesus. And the next thing you know, they're filled. You've got Cornelius. He's a Gentile. He could have heard the words of Peter and said, no, Peter, no. You see, I'm, I'm Roman, and that's not how we do No, he removed that lid, and the next thing you know, he's filled. Can I tell you, if you will remove the lid, God will fill you to overflowing. He will fill you to overflowing. This is a good point to tell you I'm talking so much more than just about tongues here. I'm talking about all the gifts of his spirit. I'm talking about his love. I'm talking about all the fruits of the spirit. I'm talking about supernatural. All that God is now resides inside of you and starts to overflow from you. I'm talking about that when you take off this lid, that when you walk into work, that, that spirit starts to spill out on other people and they go, whoa, what's different? about Cheryl, what's different about Leroy, and it, it, it impacts everybody. When they spilled out the Holy Spirit, they actually spilled out of that upper room. They went to the street, and then it spilled out on all those people, and they said, whoa, we got to stop, and we got to figure this out. I'm telling you, we need a church without a lid. You saw somebody here tonight worship the Lord with reckless abandon. I've never seen my wife worship like that. Just you rip off that lid, Sarah. You rip off that lid right now in the name of Jesus. You rip it off. If you've got whatever lid on you, you need to rip off that thing. Somebody say, rip it off. Rip it off. Oh, man. You see, as long as there's more space for water, you see, that's where we are. That's where little hidden sin comes in. This little space there, that's where that pride comes. You got to get rid of all that space and allow Jesus Christ to completely fill you. Does Jesus give us a great verse about the overflow? Oh, you bet he does. John chapter 7, verse 38, verse 39. He says this. He actually yells this. They're at a feast. He gets up. Nobody knew he was there, and he just appears out of nowhere, and he screams this at the top of his lungs. I will not scream it for you because I do not want to scare you. Whoever believes in me, as Scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. By this he meant the Spirit whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time, the Spirit had not yet been given since Jesus had not yet been glorified. He says, if you believe on me, as Scripture has said, rivers of living water, not just any kind of water, life-giving water is going to flow from where? From within. And it's going to flow out to others. Are you following me? Receiving the Spirit is not just pouring a little water into your cup. It is an overflow of living water that can only be poured by Jesus Christ. Can I tell you, I cannot pour that water. That John the Baptist said these words, The one coming after me will baptize you with the Holy Ghost and the fire. Let me tell you, we're having a baptism service next week, and your pastor is going to lower people into the water. I'm going to baptize them in the water, but I cannot baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Who can baptize you with the Holy Spirit? The Lord Jesus Christ, the one coming after John. He will baptize you with what? The Holy Spirit and the fire. Do you want that? Do you want Jesus? My goodness, I'm, I, want, I want you to let me baptize you, but I definitely want you to let the Lord Jesus Christ baptize you. Can I tell you, it doesn't make sense to let an earthly man baptize you, but not let the Lord Jesus Christ baptize you. That makes no sense at all. No sense at all. 
my goodness, we need the spirit overflowing. We need it spilling out past the brim. So I told you about this this lid. Sarah, my wife, we've already mentioned in Barris, was raised in a denomination. By the way, when I mention denominations, I usually never mention them by name. Why? Because I love people. And I don't want you to think because I say the name of a denomination that we have anything against them. We count them all brothers and sisters in Christ. We love every one of you. I don't care what denom- you might be watching this right now and disagree with everything I said. OK, I love you. You're a brother in the Lord. Find the new thing God has for you. OK, deal. All right. So she was raised in another denomination. That taught her that speaking in tongues was of the. The devil. That's what that they made no bones about it. That church down there, they're of the devil. They speak in tongues. If you speak in tongues, man, they'll, they'll, they will say these little whispering things. Sarah tells me these stories like, oh, did you hear this? That lady that came to our church? Yeah, she gave me a weird vibe. I think that she's speaking tongues. You know, that's the devil's. That's the devil's work. Right. Can I tell you what that was? That was a lid. And I met my wife. She wasn't my wife at the time. She was a beautiful girl standing outside Taco Diner. We formed a relationship. We talked. And you know what? Came up. I'm Pentecostal. I'm, I'm from a Pentecostal background. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Do you, have you ever received the Holy Spirit? And she's like, I, I don't believe in speaking in tongues. And we had this said, we got to look at the word of God together. I don't want you to take my word for it. I want to look at the word of God together. And she read the word of God and she removed her lid and one day she came to a space a lot like this one at the front of a stage they called it the altar and she came to that stage and you know what she did she went to pray for someone else and while she was praying for someone else she felt something happen in her that never happened before she was praying prayers over someone and suddenly that language changed into something she didn't know what it was what happened the lord filled her past the brim to overflowing with his spirit it can only happen if you take off the lid it can only happen if you want it you can absolutely block jesus from doing this but you can remove that lid and he will do it he will do it do you trust him Do you trust him? Will you let your religious background, whatever it is, keep you from the new thing that Jesus Christ has for you? I hope not. I hope not. I hope you'll be bold and say, no way. You can't keep me from Jesus. I've come this far by faith. I'm going to go all the way in him. Somebody say, in Jesus' name. That's right. All right. God has this experience for you. Just like he had it for Sarah when she yielded to his spirit and was filled to overflow. But you have to take off the lid. You have to. Here is what I am not saying. These are important things to to not say. Okay. Let me spend some time saying not things. I'm looking at you, Vicki, because that was the worst written sentence ever. All right. Here's what I'm not saying. If you have never had the experience that I spoke of tonight, I'm not saying you don't have a relationship or an experience with God. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that. If you've not had an experience like we read about in Acts 19, I am not saying that you do not know Jesus Christ. My goodness, I was raised in a church that's kind of said that too much. Wrong. They were wrong. You have an experience with God. You believe in Jesus. That was the spirit drawing you to that very thing. You, you've had him forgive your sins. You know him and you've had an experience with him. I'm absolutely saying that you have no experience. with. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that there's something more. That there's something new looking on. I'm not saying you're going to hell because you had the, you didn't have this experience. You get me? I'm not saying you're going to hell. I'm saying there is something more that there's something new. I'm not saying this one's important that you need to seek tongues. Oh, man, I need to speak in tongues. All right, tongues, 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 tongues. How do I do it? Tongues. Do, re, mi, fa, so. Was that it? No. I'm not saying that you need to seek tongues. No, you need to seek more of God. 
you don't receive this this thing by receiving by seeking an experience. You receive this thing by seeking the Lord, seek more of God, because there is more of him for us. And it is something more and it is something new. Are you with me? We're about to open up these altars, but before we do, I want you to go back to Acts 2.38. We've just been Acts 2.38-ing it up tonight. Will you read this out loud with me? Read it out loud. Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Will you read that last sentence with me? And you will receive the gift of of the Holy Spirit. Can I tell you, I've got three small points right here. Number one, it's a gift. Sorry, sir, we're not making those noises right now. You're going to listen. It's a gift. Peter did not say that you need to earn the Holy Spirit. He said, it's a gift. How do you get a gift? You simply receive the gift. It's a gift. Number two, it's a promise. The receiving of the Holy Spirit is a promise. Jesus calls it the promise of the Father in Luke 24, 49. Jesus, call, Jesus calls it a promise in Acts chapter 1, verse 4. It says the very next verse, Peter calls it a promise. Can we look at the very next verse, verse 39? Acts 2, verse 39. The promise is for you. And your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. It says what? The promise. Let me tell you, here's the promise. He says, repent, be baptized, you shall. Do you see a promise there? Repent, be baptized, you will receive. All right. Verse 39 says that that promise is for you. For who, who, who else is it for? To, for your children. Who else is it for? For all that are far off. Who else is it for? To all that the Lord our God will call. That's everybody. This promise is for everybody. Some people say that this promise died out with the last apostle. No, sir. That promise is for everybody. It is for everybody. Here's the third thing. It's a gift. It's a promise. Here's the last one. It's for you. It's for you. It's for you. The gift and promise is for you. Do you want it? I understand if this feels uncomfortable. New is often uncomfortable. But can you trust God enough to step into the new that he has for you? I've done my best to give you the word of God today. I want you to know these last three things. I'm going to read them to you. God's word has a lot more to teach us about the gift of the spirit. A lot. We've only scratched the surface. I've held a lot back just because of time. Number two, before you receive the spirit, you must receive the message. That's the word. And let's be honest. You may not be ready to receive what I shared with you today, but there is still room for you to receive something new from the Lord today. There is still room in this altar for people who are struggling with belief. You can come to this altar and struggle with your uh, with your unbelief right here. In fact, that's the place for you to struggle with your unbelief. Not in your chair, but right here in this altar. There is room in this altar for people to wrestle with truth. And if that is you, I welcome you to come and get prayer in the first two feet. When you approach, when we, we, when we approach you and ask you how you would like us to pray for you, what you do is you say, hey, I'm having trouble believing all of this. And guess what? No one's going to stone you. No one's going to judge you. No one's going to point at you and say, what? Look at this turkey over here. No, we're going to pray for you. If you're having trouble believing any of this, I want you in this altar and I want to pray with you today. Third thing is this. If you believe, then you are ready to receive. Come receive the gift after we do the very important thing. We repent. Everyone on their feet. We're going to repent. We are repenting of our sin. Raise your hand if you are a sinner in this place. Raise your hand if you have sin that you need the Lord to forgive you of. Pray after me. Repeat after me. Father, I'm a sinner. Forgive me of my sin. I've said the wrong things. I've done the wrong things. I've thought the wrong things. Forgive me of my sin. I want to turn towards you, and I want all the new things you have for me. I take the lid off right now in the name of Jesus. When you came in here, someone handed you a lid. 
I want you to bring your lid tonight to this altar. I want you to leave it here, and I want you to tell God, I am giving up my lid. I want you to fill me. Come right now. I want to pray with people in this house. Come on, church. Let's talk to God in this place. Father, I thank you for your presence in this place. Lord, I thank you for the truth. God, I thank you for the closeness of the spirit. Lord, I want you to fill this place with your spirit. Lord, I want you to fill everybody watching, listening online with the new things that you have for them. Father, in Jesus' name, let them call on you. Let them repent and let them find you right now in the name of Jesus. Friend, do not seek tongues, but seek God and call out to God and he will give you this brand new thing. He loves you and the promise is for you in the name of Jesus. Come on church, let's talk to God in this house. For more information about redemption, look us up online at redemption-church.com. We want to hear from you, so be sure to connect with us on Facebook, Twitter, or even our anonymous question text line at 214-856-0550. Thank you for joining us and have a blessed day.